All right, so thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in Florence, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, some aspects of ADS-CFT. Um, as you might appreciate, uh, ADS-CFT has been around for about 20 years, uh, and um, if you go back to the first review that was written almost within a year after the first paper on the subject, that review already has close more than 500 references. So you can only imagine that my job of trying to cover all of ADS-CFT in 12 lectures, 12 hours, is next to impossible. Um, so what I have decided to do is give you a slightly um, personal perspective on how to think about ADS-CFT. And um, my goal here is to try to give you uh, an approach that sort of is at once um, um, both tries to give you a flavor for what it's what the what what the correspondence is and and what it can be used for. So it's going to be idiosyncratic. It's not going to be comprehensive. And um, I, I, the kind of topics I want to cover, at least the rough outline. which depends on how fast, how far we go, um, is I, I'll start by talking about the basics of ADS-CFT. I'll try to give you a definition without invoking the genesis in string theory, and then um, talk, of, talk about what the dictionary is. I want to focus, spend a lot of time focusing on um, properties of quantum field theories that you can learn from ADS-CFT that are properties that you don't usually tend to study uh, unless, um, at least not in high energy. These are properties you tend to study much more if you're a statistical mechanics person or a condensed matter theorist. So I'm going to try to describe for you how to think about um, Physics and physics of density matrices, and um, this impacts two subjects. One is um, thermodynamics, which we will see corresponds then to studying black holes. And the second, which is fashionable these days, is the physics of entanglement, which also to some extent involves black holes, but we can do a bit more than that. You have a better suggestion? Yeah, what about it? This way is better? OK. OK, let's see if that keeps stable. OK. Um, and once I, once I build this dictionary up, I then want to talk about how we might use ADS-CFT to formulate Of effective field theories of effective field theories in um, mixed states. Right. So, so this is going to be sort of the beginning. This might even be mostly, most of this I might even sort of set up today, depending on how fast we go. And this is going to be bulk of the, uh, of the story. And, and to do this, I'm going to have to introduce for you, um, at least I'll show you how this can be made to work in a very particular example. Um, and, to, and, and to get there, I have to introduce for you various concepts in hydrodynamics, and then 
how to think about quantum field theories in density matrices and, and, and work our way to how to write down effective field theories. So that's sort of the general plan for the next few days. So let me get started by um, talking about uh, what I want to do today. But uh, before I do that, let me at least write down a few references that I thought are useful for this. Um, so most of you probably know the reviews. There are some classic reviews on ADS-CFTs. The old one by the Okay, and let's remember the names. And then there's a review by Docker and Friedman. Um, there's a more recent review by my colleague Veronica Hubeni from earlier this year. And there's a review by, uh, there's a book by Johanna Erdmenger. And there's an earlier review that I wrote with Veronica on non-equilibrium physics. In 2010. And this should keep us going for a while, and I'll give more references as, as we go on. All right. So, so with that basic story in place, let me get to the business end of things. So let's talk about what is the statement of the correspondence. And I, I'll state it very simply. Um, the say correspondence simply says that dynamics of quantum fields um, are, it's a duality between a class of field theories with conformal symmetry and dynamics of gravity in asymptotic ADS space times. In other words, it asserts that if you have a quantum field theory with a UV fixed point, which is conformal, with some Hilbert space, H and some algebra of observables, um, let's call it script A, then this statement just says that the Hil Hilbert space of the CFT is isomorphic to the Hilbert space of gravity and that the algebra of the CFT is isomorphic to the algebra of gravity. So the states are in one-to-one -one correspondence and the, and the operators 
in the two sides and in one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, it's a slightly funny statement to make because we understand this guy reasonably well. We understand what Hilbert space of quantum field theory is. We also understand what observables we can talk about in a quantum field theory. Um, and in most cases, at least non-perturbatively, this guy is less well understood. Okay? So uh, one, one perspective you can take, and this is a perspective that most people do take, is that what ADS-EFT does for you is it actually defines these two quantities that we haven't managed to define precisely in any uh, definite sense. Uh, we, ha we don't have a theory of quantum gravity um, that allows us to define these things to the, uh, um, in a manner that we would really like. String theory comes close, but string, even string theory, which, which I, I take to be a theory of quantum gravity, doesn't do a good enough job because it doesn't give you these, these quantities in a fully non-perturbative fashion. If you ask even in string theory, what, what is the fully non-perturbative Hilbert space of string theory or the fully non-perturbative uh, algebra of observables of quantum gravity, the answers are best described on, in terms of left-hand side. But I claim that th this should exist. This should exist independently. And one should be able, um, uh, with um, uh, at, at least I, I hope, at some point, um, to, to define these things in a clean enough fashion, and then show that they are indeed isomorphic to what what, what there is. So, so that's the sort of uh, ground level statement that, that we can use as as what the correspondence actually is, um, and uh, of course. You know, this is not how this correspondence was arrived at in the first place. It was arrived at by doing something completely different. And, uh, but people quickly re realized that, or Malasena himself quickly realized that this has a profound implication to what this, um, w what I say here. So how was it derived? So I, I'll be very sketchy here because um, I, I understand that you've just started your string theory course and that goes on um, uh, th through the week and into next week. So I, I'm just going to give you sort of a, a broad brush sketch of where this comes from and, and then just take it as, a, as given and, and see what we can learn from, the, from there on. So, so So I, I'd say that the ADS-CFT is, is, is an example of open closed string duality. More generally, and this open closed duality in string theory can be attained in many more contexts than in ADS, just just restricted to ADS-CFT. So the picture is as follows, open strings have endpoints which, which have to lie on d brains Again, I'll refer you to your string theory course to know what exactly d brains are. Um, and the picture one has is one has a stack of op D brains and some number of open strings that sort of stretch between these D brains. So this open string dynamics may be some gauge, th is typically some gauge theory. It could be a Young Mills theory. It doesn't have to be Young Mills theory. It could be a John Simons matter theory. But it doesn't matter that there is some gauge theory that, that, that sort of. Um, that, that describes the dynamics of these open strings living on D-brains, but these D-brains are not sort of, they exist in some ambient space-time. You know, there's hypersurfaces 
in in some space time so so this this whole story it sits inside some closed string dyna closed string theory where the closed strings propagate uh, off the d brain whereas the open strings can propagate off the d brain at least the bulk of the open strings don't have to sit on the d brain but their endpoints have to okay now you can take this take this picture and you can do two things to it on the one hand you can ask well look all these guys all these op all these um, uh, so so as far as the closed string theory in which i put these d brains so the d brains are, are like defects okay they're like defects that i put into some 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 closed string theory and and they carry some internal degrees of freedoms which are the open strings right. so what you can try to do is you can say well since they are defects which ca and they ca and the d brains carry energy and and charges you can ask well why don't i I'll take many of these d brains if i if i take sufficiently many of them it, I, i will be throwing in lots of energy and lots of charges into my system once i throw in lots of energy and lots of charges instead of trying to describe them in terms of um so just as in electrodynamics i can talk about single charges but once i have lots of charges and i i i i can in electrodynamics forget talking about the individual charges and pass on to talking about the effective electromagnetic field created by those charges that which is what you see at long distances okay so let me talk so one one thing you can do is you can you can sort of back react the d brains and talk about the uh, you can allow the d brains to modify the geometry and talk about the closed string the prop propagating on a new jump on a new background which is the one obtained by sort of looking at the long distance physics of of the brain charges okay so so typical example is if you have d3 brains which have a four which have four dimensional world volume they have an sun gauge theory living on them so if i have nd3 brains they have an sun super young mills theory living on the world volume so this is sometimes called n equals 4 theory because it has 32 supercharges so it has 16 supercharges plus 16 super conformal charges it's a special theory but and this could be in flat space we could start with these things in flat space time and this pro and this process of allowing the brains to be replaced by their fluxes ends up giving you a type a new geometry which is usually called the black three brain geometry it's not really black but people that's what people call it um and the matrix so in this case is something quite nice uh let me write it So the three brains have a four four dimensional world volume they're sitting in 10 dimensional flat space time which is where super string theories live and so so it's four four dimensions are being filled by some some charge some point charge like objects so these are points in six dimensions i have parameterized the flat space in six dimensions by polar coordinates and th they're spherically symmetric in those six dimensions so if i if i sort of look at it from 10 from from in those six dimensions i have a 
point point charge living at the origin which is and and it's creating some effective gravitational potential and some other charge potential which i'm not writing down just like electromagnetic charges and this function h of r which is this gravitational potential created by the d3 brains is simple where r is proportional is determined in terms of n the function of n for now i won't write what what this function of n is so this is measuring the total number of d3 points and uh, little r is a coordinate okay so the geometry looks something like this so i i, I have these three brains embedded in so imagine that this is the radial coordinate so i will i will draw instead of drawing 10 dimensions i will draw time and this coordinate x so i'll draw two of these coordinates so this is this is three dimensional wall volume and i'll draw one radial direction and what this ends up doing is that you get a geometry where you have flat space time far away because if i go far away from the brains in this radial direction then what i have is i see point sources <coughs> whose potentials decay away so I, they decay away so like any charge potential they decay away as some power law so I, i get flat space time back but as i go closer to the brains the geometry gets distorted just as a, 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 as i go close towards a point charge in electrodynamics the coulomb potential blows up like 1 over r squared this case the coulomb potential blows up like 1 over r to the 4 but something as you see so, something nice happens as i go to the near to the to the limit where so the 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 brains in some sense are at r equals 0 but as i go closer towards r equals 0 the geometry opens up and i get a new space time this new space time which we'll see is ads5 times s5 the s5 part is easy to see because as r goes to 0 this factor of h to the half r goes like 1 over r squared and that r squared cancels that 1 over r squared cancels this r squared sitting in front of the phi sphere matrix so you get a sphere of constant size whatever is remaining is ads5 so this matrix here So, so so that's so that's the level of replace so th th so this is th this at this point it's not even duality it's just saying that the two equivalent ways of thinking about deep brains in string theory one is in is in terms of the explicit open strings which there are and the other is in terms of replacing the brains thinking of the brains as sources of charges uh, closed string charges and replacing them by their fluxes in this case i've just drawn for you the gravitational flux of the deep brain i have ignored all the other fluxes they carry yeah um actually for, for for the way i have presented it here i've i've told told you what the answer is for next extremal d3 brain but we, we can do a near extremal d3 brain and, and get similar results okay so i i'll tell you why we need to do the near extremal in in a second when i tell you what so the solution exists even if i go away from extremality in fact the solution is very simple um you just replace let's see do i have color i have color so um put a function f of r in front of dt squared so i'll just write it in blue and put a fun function 1 over f of r in front of dr squared and f of r is also another simple function and that's a non extremal d3 brain solution okay. so these solutions were known long ago they were written on much before d brains were well 
depends how you count, but deep brains, as deep brains were only invented in 94, the solutions were written down in 91. So, so this is a simple picture, but no, now we can do something interesting. And this was understood by Malasena after a sequence of calculations that were done in the mid-90s by various people trying to understand how to do various scattering experiments in this geometry. And the, pic and the, and the picture is this. Well, let's, let's talk about, let's take the open string description. So I'll call the left-hand side of this picture the open string description, and the right-hand side the closed string description. So according to me, this was dbrains plus closed strings. In flat space. And this was just closed strings in a funny geometry. Let me call it the back reactor back geometry. Maybe brain back reactor geometry. So, so once I have this, let me do two things. Let me take the low energy limit on both sides. Well, in, on this side, you can give a reasonably easy argument to say that, well, gravitational physics happens at the Planck scale. It happens at 10 dimensional Planck scale. So if I go to scales that are much, much lower than 10 dimensional Planck scale, I'm only left with the physics of degrees of freedom that don't talk gravitationally. Okay? Because I, essentially, if you like, going much below the Planck scale amounts to setting Newton's constant to zero. Things don't interact gravitationally on this side. So, but the, but the D-brain, the open string th degrees of freedom, opens, there's an interacting theory of open strings. which is this SUN super young mills in four dimensions. Okay. So essentially what I've done is by zooming down to low, low energies, I've thrown away all the closed string degrees of freedom, I've thrown away all the complications of string theory, I've thrown away all the excited open strings, I've localized myself on the low energy sector, which is just some well-known young mills theory, if I'm doing D3 brains, but the story is much more general if I do other brains. This side, the, the back reactor geometry at low energies gives me, um, well, what does it give me? So now I have to tell you what, what, what the, what's, what's happening. In some sense, it's sort of clear from this picture, and, and one has to justify this, but let me just give you the heuristics. So going to low energies, somehow in this, because I'm zooming onto the D-brains and keeping only the open strings, it's tantamount to saying you sort of zoom onto the D-brains and forget about the fact that they live in some ambient space-time. Okay, they were sitting in 10 dimensions, but you just forget about it. You zoom onto the D-brains. But that's like going towards R equals zero in this picture. So if you're going to do that, then, then effectively what's happening is that you're sort of zooming in in this picture towards the domain where r equals 0, which is this near horizon limit with metric here. So what you get is not closed strings in some complicated geometry of the D3 brains. We just get the closed strings in ADS 5 cross S5. And, uh, okay, so the, the argument is very, is obtained, is, 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 this is very heuristic, but we can now go ahead and check whether this picture actually makes sense. 
<coughs> so to, to, to make this picture reasonable, I have to tell you a couple of things. So let me say the following, how, how, how this dictionary works, and, and, and then, 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 then we'll see what it implies. So the claim is the following. So on the one side, this is an ordinary quantum field theory without gravity. And on, the, on this side, this is a quantum gravity theory because it's a theory of closed strings in some, some geometry. Okay? Not, not maybe flat space closed strings, but it's closed strings in some geometry. So, so this is the prototype, but we want to now take this prototype and argue that the lesson we draw from this prototype extends to a wide class of quantum field. Okay? So you, you could, you could am make the following ambitious statement that underlying every interacting quantum field theory is a dual area space-time with some funny quantum gravity theory. Okay, it's for for most for si for simple theories, you may you may not need this side to to be able to understand the quantum field theory. Right. So if you're, if you're trying to understand a certain model, trying to cook up a quantum gravity theory in areas that describe the standard model is a bit of a far-fetched exercise. It might be theoretically interesting, but it, it gives us no deeper insight into how quantum standard model works. But for some theories, I'm going to argue that this is a much better way of understanding the field theory than what you can do with the field theory. And why is that? So, so to, to understand that, let me, let me tell you two things. Um, let, let's just understand how this mapping works in terms of at least kinematics of the correspondence. So closed strings, so I, I'll keep writing again this this two column format for where I, where I write open, the open string picture on the, on the on the left and the closed string picture on the right okay so closed strings have two parameters there's a planck scale where gravity becomes important and there's a string scale where stringy effects become important these are not the same length scale they're, they're distinct Right, and there's a third dimensionless parameter which is which relates them, which is the uh, string coupling. So in ten dimensions, the relation between them is the hierarchy between the string length and the Planck length is given by this. Um, the powers of eight are easy to understand. The Newton's constant in d dimensions is proportional to L Planck to the d minus two. Right. In four dimensions, the Einstein-Hilbert term has one over g Newton times the uh, Ricci scalar. So that's how the Newton's constant is I, I, I define the Newton's constant as a coefficient in front of the Ricci scalar in the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian. The Ricci scalar is a two derivative object, so it soaks up two of the, the engineering dimensions of this are two less than the space-time dimension. <coughs> the quantum field theory has so these are the parameters that, that we need. And, and you see that if I want perturbative string theory, so the G, G string is small, then there's a hierarchical separation between the string scale and the Planck scale. So quantum gravity effects, which are effects at the, string, at the Planck scale, kick in much later than stringy effects kick in. Okay. On, the, on this open string side, we have two, two other parameters. We have the 
quantum field theories typically have some coupling constant. which tells us the strength of interactions. There could be many coupling constants, but I want a typical scale. You know, you know, there could be multiple couplings in a given quantum field theory. I, I'll, I'll talk about the typical one. And there is a, there's a sort of what I will call the central charge. I'll, I might define this later a bit more carefully, but for now, let, let's pretend that this is just a rough proxy for the number of degrees of freedom. Okay. So in this example, which I've been talking about so far, in SUN yang mills theory, the central charge, so let me call this C, um, let me call this C effective, because it's not quite the central charge of the, of the theory. C effective scales like n squared minus 1, which is actually C effective is proportional to n squared minus 1, which is roughly n squared if n is much, much bigger than 1. Okay. And the coupling constant, let me call that lambda, and since I'm eventually going to take this limit n much, much bigger than 1 in a second, I'm, I'm going to treat this coupling constant as a toft coupling, because I'm going to do large n, which is the standard Young-Mills coupling constant rescaled by a factor of n. Okay? But, but don't worry about what this lambda is in, this, in the present case. In general, there's some coupling constant lambda. <coughs> so, Let's understand how, this, how these two things are related. And the claim is this. So to do that, we need to, we need to know some, some details of how this mapping works in the D3 brain case. But uh, I, I'll tell you the answer of a calculation, <coughs> which is the following. So lambda goes like, um, sorry. So n goes like, 1 over g string and lambda goes like which is um, okay and lambda goes like I had this parameter r, over l string to the one quarter. So r is the size of, this, of the S5, is the radius of S5, and is also the curvature scale of ADS5. Okay. So now no, so now 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 we have something interesting to say. So, so the, sorry I should have put the scale as well. So there's the curvature scale of the geometry. So I had, I had three length scales, so I can form two dimensionless constants. I formed them, string, string coupling, and this ratio. And the field theory has two dimensionless, has a dimensionless coupling lambda, and a central charge, which is dimensionless, which is n. So you see, if you want, if you want a hierarchy between semi-classical physics, string theory, and quantum gravity to separate we want the following hierarchy, we want that this 
scale should should um, satisfy this inequality. If the Planck scale is much much smaller than the string scale, then um, what did I do? I screwed up somewhere. Ah, sorry. Doesn't make sense. Sorry, sorry. Um, I, I G Newton is L Planck to the D minus two, so G, um, the string couple, this, this L Planck to the eight is string length to eight times G string squared. So a string length being much larger than a Planck length means a G string is small. In string interactions are small, so you can do classical string theory. But if I study geometries, or if I study physics on scales much, much bigger than the st string scale, then I can forget about the fact that I had strings in my theory. I can approximate string theory by its, the, I can approximate classical string theory by the classical theory of the zero modes of the string, which is classical gravity. Okay? Closed strings, as, as you've already told them today, closed strings have gravitons. Okay, tomorrow you will know that closed strings have gravitons, so uh, th then you will understand the statement that cl classical closed string theory has as a subset classical gravitational physics. Okay, but that classical gravitational physics is contaminated by all the stringy corrections. You can switch off those stringy corrections if you look at string theory on length scales which are much, much bigger than the string scale. Right? So, So in this limit, in this hierarchy, if this hierarchy is satisfied, it requires that n is much, much bigger than 1. And it requires that lambda is much, much bigger than 1. So for classical string limit, of quantum gravity, it suffices for us to get a large n limit. But for classical gravity limit, I further need that all the curvature scales are much bigger than the string scale which implies that lambda is much, much bigger than 1, which means we need to go to the strong coupling limit. And, and here's the opportunity and, and the frustration of ADS-CFT correspondence. The opportunity is simply that, see, large n is not, is not terrible. You, know, you, can, you can get large n by taking n to be 10, roughly speaking. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, many things that people do for young mills theory on the lattice with n of order five is pretty good. Uh, you can you, you can see nice nice results with n of order five because the, the coupling constant is the, the the one over n corrections go like one over n squared for for gauge theories. So one over five is one over twenty five. So you get four percent of the answer. But Strong coupling is where things get messy. We can't solve quantum field theories outside perturbation theory. If you, any quantum field theory course you've learned, you start by doing lambda phi to the four, and you treat lambda to be small. This is like asking to do, asking you to do lambda phi to the four, some more complicated and UV complete version of lambda phi to the four in the strong coupling limit. So, 
So we don't know how to solve the field theory except in special cases. But the claim from this scheme of logic that I've outlined is that it doesn't matter because you can learn things about these strongly coupled theories by studying classical gravity in some space time. And th therein lies the power of ADS CFT that we don't have to s solve quantum field theory dynamics, we can solve classical gravity dynamics. Okay? So that, 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 that's an answer that's been given to us. And to justify the answer, we'd have to finish this, define this, this part of the program and, and show that it actually works. That, that's a long-term uh, story. But for now, what we're going to do is, is take this as a given and see what we can learn from here. Um, so, y yes, so y you will see that for most part, I'm going to avoid the super in everything. There will be some super that comes, there will be some super symmetry that comes in and goes at various points, but at this point I'm in super gravity. Be I, because I actually want to make a stronger statement. I want to make the statement that even your favorite quantum field theory, a UV complete quantum field theory, which doesn't have any super symmetry, also has some closed string description in terms of some string theory in ADS space. Okay, so if you come if you come to me and ask me define this closed string theory, I'll throw up my hands and say I don't know. Right? Because even here, even in the case of type two B string theory, we don't know what the theory is non perturbatively. But the, the the logic of the correspondence suggests that such, such a thing should exist. Right? That that, that that's the statement. So so so, so that, that that's the gist of the statement. So maybe to make the, make the point much more starkly, the Ising model in 1 plus 1 dimensions is a famous conformal field theory. There must be a string theory which is dual to the Ising model. The fact that we haven't been able to write it down doesn't mean anything. The theory should exist by this logic. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a theory at the, at the antipode of this point because that theory has a central charge where n is half. So it's not in a large end limit. There is no classical description to the theory. It's a completely quantum gravity theory. But for the purposes of what I'm saying, it, it's, a, it's a tautology. I'm just saying that I'm just asserting this equality between Hilbert spaces and algebra. So for given that Hilbert space rising model and the operator's rising model, there is a theory which is a quantum gravity theory. I mean, the tautological definition is to define it in terms of the Ising model theory, but I'm, I assert that there should be an independent existence. Right? <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so 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 so, so you know, so, so this is how the correspondence was derived, and uh, uh, let me spend two minutes giving you um, my, my take on. Um, some subtleties with this because I have glossed over a couple of them. So, let and, and and use the opportunity to sort of um, say, say something a bit more. <coughs> general and abstract. So, I want to say the following. So say you're given a quantum field, quantum field theory with central charge C effective and some coupling, let's call it, keep calling it lambda. Don't have to be the N equals for coupling. These are just parameters that describe the quantum field theory. Then I, 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 th there is some relation which says that um, for <coughs> C effective much, much bigger than one, quantum gravity effects becomes classical. And it's not always true that this classical theory 
is classical string theory. Okay. So the classical theory could be some classical string theory. If the corner field theory has, roughly speaking, I like this terminology, I'll explain this, um, matrix-like degrees of freedom. Okay, so if it was the gauge theory where the degrees of freedom are matrices, the gauge, you know, are joint valued matrices of some gauge, gauge group, SUN-like gauge group, then I claim it's a classical string theory. Okay. But it could be some classical um, uh, for vector-like degrees of freedom. So here, I mean, so prototype example is SUN Young Mills, and this is the ON Sigma model. So both both these theories have classical limits. Both of them have large n limits. The central charge here is C effective is proportional to n squared for the matrix theories, and C effective is proportional to n for the um, vector models. The vector models are distinguished by the fact that objects here are vectors of ON, so they have one one index, whereas here they're matrices. They have each. Okay, that's why so the counting of degrees of freedom is clear because vectors have n n components, matrices have n squared components, and and both examples of both of these are known. It's believed that if you try to quantum complete these higher spin theories they will sit inside some quantum gravity theory, which is, it's a, which is a string theory. There's some evidence for that, but it's very weak. And then we need some strong coupling limit. To decouple, plan to decouple excited string modes. Okay, and uh, that's that's one set of statements that one can very trivially make from 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 extrapolating what we know in various contexts. And uh, the duality is not dimension specific. So I'm going to say the following. So I'm going to say that a d plus one <coughs> dimensional quantum field theory is dual to some theory of gravity in ADS d plus one, maybe times some internal space, which I'll call x. I put that in brackets because sometimes, in some cases, we know what x is. In some cases, we don't know what x is. So here are some examples of well-known dualities. So here is the CFT2, which is the um, symmetric product orbifold. Um, so it's a It's a two-dimensional CFT where the target space fields are n copies of a four torus, quotiented by the permutation group Sn that permutes the n copies. So this is a this is a 
well-known conformal field theory. It's a very, very strange conformal field theory. And this is dual to st strings on <coughs> ADS3 cross S3 cross D4. In three dimensions, there's a theory which is called n equals eight um, theory, which is best described as a un level k times a un level minus k on Simon's theory coupled to by fundamental yeah, um, okay after a bit more precise this is coupled this is in the limit when k goes to 1 um, this is strings on ads4 times a 7 um, in four dimensions we've already seen the example which is n equals 4 super young mills uh, gauge group sun this is dual to strings on ADS 5 times this 5. Um, there's a mysterious theory called the 2 comma 0 theory with central charge scaling like n cubed in d equals 6 which is dual to ADS 7 times this 4. Um, in string theory parlance, this comes from the D1, D5 system. It comes from an intersection of D1 brains with D5 brains. This comes from M2 brains. This comes from D3 brains. This comes from M5 brains. And these are some of the prototype, prototype models in their respective dimensions. We can deform every one of them to construct more exotic theories in every one of these dimensions with less supersymmetry. It's much harder to do things without any supersymmetry, but even that you can do. Okay, so, but, but if you want to break supersymmetry down to n equals 1 in four dimensions, we know of many examples where you have theories on ADS5 times some internal space, um, which, is, which preserves n equals 1 supersymmetry. Oh yes, uh, it doesn't have to be ten, and and uh, so it depends whether it comes from string theory or M theory. Okay, and okay, so so here these are really M two brains, so they live in M, M theory. So this theory has a limit where this becomes ADS four cross CP three. Okay which is D brains in type 2A theory, D2 brains in type 2A theory. And then, then you can play games by scaling N and K appropriately. Okay, so, so K goes to one theory is really ADS4 cross S7. But if I take K and N large with ratio of K over N fixed, then I actually get ADS4 times CP, CP3. Okay, so, so it's a question of whether, so the more precise way to say it, I didn't say it because you haven't, you haven't seen all of this yet. The right way to say it is that on this side, I'm giving you a presentation of the quantum field theory in some canonical form. Most of these quantum field theories are, have supersymmetry, so they don't have a unique vacuum. So they have a moduli space of vacua. They can have multiple vacua, and in fact, there can be a manifold of vacua, a continuum manifold of vacua. Some point in their moduli space, the string theory looks like this. At other points in their moduli space, the string theory looks more different. Okay, so, so so I'm giving you the presentation, you know, on both sides, at nice points in moduli space. Okay, so so that's the easiest way to say it. Okay. 
Yes, I can. So I was going to give you as a fifth example the higher spin theory. So, <coughs> so take take the f take this theory. Take the U N. Um, Actually, let's, let's just take the simpler theory. Take the ON sigma model. This is Heisenberg spin chain with n um, uh, at large n. It's a free field theory. This is claimed to be ah, with a singlet constraint, which makes it not interesting. <coughs> so the, the fields here are pions which have vector vector indices in ON. So you, you basically project onto the singlets of ON. Okay? You can do it two ways. You can project by hand, which is a funny thing to do. Or you can take this here and we're in 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 in, um, in two plus one dimensions. Okay, in two plus one dimensions, you can implement a singlet constraint by coupling this to an O N gauge field by a Chern Simons term. So you don't make a dynamical gauge field. Chern Simons Chern Simons interactions don't give you dynamical gauge. Unlike Yang Mills interactions, don't give you dynamical gauge symmetry, but it it does the job of imposing singlet constraint because of the gauge theory. Okay, so this theory is very well studied. This theory is dual to the Vasiliev higher spin theory. On ADS4. Okay, this was first conjectured by Klebanov and Polyakov many many years ago, uh, and uh, there's a lot of evidence for this, following some impressive piece of work by Ji Yin and Simone Giombi, and then. Um, it has been generalized in various other contexts. You know, the, the, it's actually nicer to study the UN theory, but it's a bit, more, bit less familiar because the ON vector model is a bit more familiar. And there's, a much, there's another class of theories that are interesting, which Matthias Gabardial and Rajesh Kupak Kumar have developed in the last couple of years, which is to take the Vesumino Witten coset, which is SUN in, in um, D equals 2. S U N level K so it's, uh, some two dimensional conformal field theory, you know, I can tell you what it looks like in greater detail. And for N much much bigger than one, K much much bigger than one with K over uh, n over n plus k equals lambda fixed. This is a uh, Vasiliev theory in ADS3. In fact, you can even think of it as an SL lambda times SL lambda John Simon's theory. I, I, I can be a bit more specific, but let, let me just say it's a lambda. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But. So, so people know many examples. Um, okay, so no, there are as uh, has been called in literature non-ADS, non-CFT dualities. Um, you can have a quantum field theory. So my perspective here is that you know if I describe a Conformal fixed point, then you can def and the usually most conformal field theories do not have relevant operators, so you can deform away and you can talk about general CFTs as the RG flow obtained from a conformal fixed point. So once you have this story, you can go beyond. But but yeah, you can certainly do non-conformal theories. People have studied people have studied theories that are more closer to QCD, which have non-trivial RG flows. So so lots of examples are written. I'm just writing on the simplest ones, which are. Um, conformal field theories because they're easier to say in words what they are. So. In, the, in, the, in other words, 
if I tell you there's a non-conformal field theory, the corresponding right-hand side has some gravity solution, which looks like this D3 brain solution that I wrote down. It has some, some asymptotically ADS region. It has some other stuff happening in the core of the geometry. So I can't give it a simple name like it's something in ADS space-time. So that's why I don't write it. So I could tell you names like it's the klebanov strassler geometry or the klebanov polchinski geometry, but they don't evoke as much meaning unless I tell you what the geometry is, unlike ADS, which I'll at least describe for you in a moment. Anything else? What are Vasilyev's theories? Yeah. Um, good. So, <coughs> so gravity is a theory of spin two particles. Uh, in Minkowski space, interact. You can write down a theory of non-interacting higher spin particles. You could take some sp spin s in the Lorentz group and write down a linear theory for it. You could write down a linear wave equation, which is like a graviton wave equation for a spin s particle. What's well known? is that it's very hard to make an interaction, interacting theory in Minkowski space. Okay, if you want to couple interacting theories of higher spin particles, they don't, they don't work well with gravity. Okay. What Vasiliev showed, Fredkin and Vasiliev showed in the uh, um, almost late 80s, early 90s, and, and subsequently, is that it's possible to write down interesting interacting theories of higher spin particles in ADS spacetime. That's right. So it's, it's a statement that comes out of knowing what happens uh, about scattering properties. Actually, I, I can turn this logic around and, and tell you the following. So, so this, this theory has have been, have been known independently. But he, here's the logic. This is not how hist hi historically these theories were developed. So this is a free theory. The O and sigma model is a free theory at large n. Um, so you can ask, you know, I want to compute free correlators of vectors. It's trivial. You can write it down. It's free theory. Big contractions are all you, all you have. Now you can ask, OK, I give you this free theory. Can you construct for me? So my logic says for every theory of conformal field theory or whatever, that there's some gravity theory, some, some theory on the other side. Can you construct for me some, some theory which has um, something non-trivial. Okay, so so first of all, it helps to know that this O-N theory, because it's a free theory, it has a tower of higher spin conserved currents. So usually, you know, you think of the energy momentum tensor, which is the spin two current as a conserved current. But when you have free, if you have a free scalar field, um, it's a trivial exercise for you to check that the fall, the Klein-Gordon equation implies that. So free theories have infinitely many conserved currents. They're usually boring. They don't tell you anything. So uh, fa um, scale, free scalar, you know, um, Take n derivatives of phi, symmetrize the derivatives, and, and, and multiply it on phi and phi on both sides. This is the conserved current. So this is spin s conserved current. This, the, 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 symmet the symmetrization, and okay, you have to remove a trace, but th this is roughly the logic. And the, and the conservation follows trivially from Klein Gordon equation. You don't have to do very much to see this. So you can ask. I have all these conserved symmetries. What theory realizes it? So, th so statement is if I have phi has a vector index i, you can write down these kind of things. The phi phi correlators are all. All you need to know is that this is proportional to delta i j uh, over what are we in uh, two plus one dimension. So this is dimension <coughs> phi has dimension um, one right 
free, sc free scalar in, in, in two plus one dimensions. The correlation function is just this. And every endpoint function can just be obtained by playing this game, but by just big contraction. And so you can ask, you know, what quote unquote closed string theory, gra gravity theory has, gives you these as the correlation functions. And in a certain sense, the answer is this Vasiliev theory. The Vasiliev theory looks like is very complicated, has all sorts of higher spin stuff that, that you've never seen before in any basic course and quantum field theories or classical um, gravity theories. But its job is to compute free, free field correlators. So it's a complicated rewriting of free field correlators. I mean, that's not how Vasiliev found it. He found it by the amount, serious amount of work. But its post facto justification is that it, it exists to compute free field correlators. All right. So any other questions? So let's, let's do some um, basic ADS CFT, setting up the dictionary, and then um, take it from there. So to do that, I need to tell you a bit about ADS space and about how to do various things in ADS space times and how to map things between field theory and uh, this gravity side. So I motivated everything in string theory and I've done various things, but for most of what follows, I'm going to pretend that we can sort of work at large n, large central charge, strong coupling. So I'll do classical gravity in ADS for a while. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what the corrections are and what is known about some corrections in certain contexts. Okay? So for now, we're just going to study with this motivation for the last, what I gave you in the last hour, classical gravity in ADS space times. <coughs> I, of course, assume that everybody knew what ADS was. It's anti-de-sitter. I don't know why it's called anti-de-sitter, but uh, de-sitter is a name. Anti-de-sitter isn't a name, but anyway, it's called anti-de-sitter. So, <coughs> so ADS is a sp Lorentzian space-time. Um, I'll work in d plus one dimensional ADS. which solves Einstein's equations and um, work or what the cosmological constant is if I since I'm lazy to do this uh, let me try to get my Okay, and never mind. I won't get this right. But this this number can be obtained. So 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 lambda is um, is twenty. I think it's d times d minus one. And the minus sign is here. Oh, well, if you want to put the minus there, then don't put the minus here. 
I, I, I want to check this d times d minus 1, but, but I think it's correct. But uh. Okay, so there's a length scale. It's a, co it's a cosmological constant. So there's a length scale, uh, which I'll call L ADI squared. This was what I called R before, okay, this, but I'm not going to call it L ADS because I want to be very, very specific. And um, you can you can you, you can use units where it's adapted to the space-time dimension. So it, of course, you know, it, it, it's it's a, it's a particular solution to this 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 equation. And as a manifold, you can think of it as a hypersurface. in embedded in one higher dimension with funny signature d comma 2 okay so so here's a hypersurface so if coordinates are x minus 1 x 0 up to x D, uh, then the hypersurface equation is this. It's a hyperboloid and I apologize to all the quantum field theories. I don't like mostly negative signature, so I'm going to work with relativistic conventions of mostly positive signature. OK? So, so the analogy, I hope, is clear with a sphere. A sphere is a hypersurface embedded in Rd plus 1 as Sphere is just a locus of points on a, in Rd plus one in Euclidean space, with satis which are equidistant from the origin. This is a space of the same kind. Then it's not equidistant from the origin. It's just a hyperboloid prescribed by this equation. And it's because it's Lorentzian. It, it, it you don't have to em and it's the, this is the simplest embedding. There may be more other complicated embeddings, but the simplest embedding involves extending the signature to minus to d comma two 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 time like coordinates and d spatial coordinates yeah. so the uh, metric on a d s d plus one is induced from flat metric on R d comma two. Okay, so, so the flat. So you, you solve this equation, and then you just substitute the solution into this metric, and you get a metric on area space. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to write it down. So. so I'm going to write it down in multiple different coordinates um, um, just to just to do. So so here you know how to do this. So flat flat Euclidean metric in R D plus one descends to a, to the spherical metric on the sphere. Right? You can solve this equation by setting x1 to L, all of them proportional to l and then you can take angle angular variables nested angular variables to solve them right how so you want to do something similar here except that well these two can be angles a pairwise all of these can be solved in terms of a sphere but then there's one minus sign so you need to introduce some hyperbolic function to make sure that the thing works so that's the simplest solution so he, here is one 
So coordinate charts. So first one I'll talk about is a global coordinate chart. This covers the entire space time. So here, here is the coordinate chart. So x minus 1 you can take to be LADS cosh rho cosine tau x0 to be LADS sinh rho um, cosh rho sine tau and you can take x1 to xd okay let me write it this way xi to be LADS sine hyperbolic rho times omega i um, if you like omega i is our direction cosines but but really what they are is a is a vector in R, rd so that unit vector in rd I'm going to now do what I did, what I would do here. Okay. So then the matrix becomes um, cosh square rho d tau square plus sin square rho um, d omega square plus d rho square. I welcome you to plug this into your favorite software and check that it solves the equations. So it sometimes oh there's an overall L squared, so let me write it this way. It's actually useful sometimes to write it like this. Which I prefer. Um Just replace sine hyperbolic rho by r and rejig things to get this metric. <coughs> There's one subtlety which I will mention once, and uh, so this solution requires tau to be compact. Right? It's angular. It looks like tau is an angular coordinate. But in the space-time, tau is the time coordinate. So really what, what I should think of is ADS is not the space-time, but it's the universal cover of the space-time. So I have to allow tau to run over the reals to get a time coordinate that's sensible, so not, not, not a close time not a periodic time coordinate, but a non-compact time coordinate. Okay. <coughs> so what does this look like? Um, so there are many ways to say this, but let me tell you what this looks like by noting the following. As rho goes to infinity, the metric approaches oops what do I do uh, there are only d plus one dimensions d of these coordinates make a sphere so it's a d minus one sphere it's not a d sphere So at large rho, the matrix looks like this. This factor is the, is the Einstein static universe. It's just a sphere which sits for all time. It's a Lorentzian cylinder. 
So, so the geometry asymptotically approaches this Einstein static universe with a conformal factor which is diverging exponentially. Okay. So the easiest way to visualize the space-time is to think of this Einstein static universe as a cylinder where tau is the time coordinate and this angular direction is an SD minus one. I've just drawn a circular slice of it. Okay. And you fill it in with a space time with constant negative curvature. Okay, which is this mat you put this metric on onto the cylinder in the interior of the cylinder. On the boundary of the cylinder, you have the metric of Einstein static universe. It's a sphere of unit radius that sits for all time. Spatial constant t cross sections, if I cut it here, uh, sorry, constant tau cross sections, which I will draw as a disk. is an hyperbolic d minus d is hd the hyperbolic disk in d dimensions with metric just a constant tau slice of this metric And uh, if this was really, if this was a circle, not a d, d minus one sphere, d was two. This is really the matrix on the hyperbolic plane, the Poincaré, the on the Poincaré disk. Okay. So, so that's the spatial geometry. So it's 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 like I have a stacking of hyperbolic planes, which are sort of taken up in time, but there's a non-trivial time warp factor, which is this gosh tau. Okay. So two things happen. One is that it's as if, so I have this cylinder, but the cylinder has a non-trivial gravitational potential. Things want to fall into the middle of the cylinder. This is rho equals zero axis. Because going away from rho equals zero, cost you exponentially large redshift in the time direction and it's exponentially expensive in the spatial direction. So it's, it's as if you have a sort of a well, a gravitational well, and, and we'll see later that for all intents and purposes it's really like a harmonic oscillator. It's a, basically a gravitational harmonic oscillator. It looks exponential but in suitable coordinates it, it really so, a, a, ends up solving a harmonic oscillator problem. <coughs> so that's one set of coordinates. These coordinates cover with tau non-compact, understood being non-compact, these coordinates cover the entire space-time. They cover the full manifold. It's a global coordinate chart just like the Cartesian coordinates are a global chart for Minkowski space-time. Okay? There's no, there's no coordinate singularity anywhere here. This is a complete chart. So what, what is clear from this discussion is that the ADS is a space-time with a boundary. Which is this Einstein static universe itself. So it's co-dimension one. And more importantly, it's a time-like boundary, because time is part of the boundary coordinates. <coughs> so what this means is that to do classical gravity, to, to do classical physics in area space times,
we need boundary conditions. So it's a bit like uh, doing electrodynamics in a box. It, the box is in infinity, but the box is still there. So if I don't give you the right boundary conditions, you can't do physics here. So in other words, the Cauchy problem, evolution problem in ADS, is not a usual initial value problem. It's a boundary initial value problem. And uh, a related issue, which people sometimes say in, in, in relativistic context, is that ADS is not globally hyperbolic. If you don't know what globally hyperbolic means, don't worry about it. it, it globally hyperbolic space-time has a well-defined Cauchy problem without giving boundary conditions. That's a acronym space like slice. But you'll see the statement in the literature, which is why I want to mention. It. <laughs> There's a second set of coordinates, which are sometimes useful. We'll come back to this issue of boundary conditions in a second. We'll, we'll go through them in some detail. Um, but there's another set of coordinates, um, which are called the Poincaré coordinates, and I'll describe them first geometrically, and then. So this was my idea of space-time, the global space-time. And let me try to describe to you a coordinate patch that covers oops two. that covers a slice of it. It's a slice that's a piece of it that's bounded by two null surfaces. Okay, So this is a null surface, my best rendition of a null surface. It's a null plane. This is another null plane. And, and the Poincaré coordinates cover this, this part. And if I unwrap these two null planes, the boundary of Poincaré patch is not this Einstein static universe, but it's really a Minkowski space in D dimensions. Okay. So here, here are the coordinates. I'll just write down the metric for you in The two alternate ways of writing it, different people like different things. I've written it in both ways. This is the coordinate chart you will get if you recall my earlier discussion of the D3 brains. This is the coordinate chart you would get. I just replaced that R by U because I've used R for this, this coordinate chart. But this is a nicer way of writing it. Now the boundary is at U equals um, infinity or z equals 0 is the boundary. It's this entire locus. Sort of. It's not this piece 
and this locus. Okay. So th they don't cover the entire manifold, but they're useful. Like usually, you know, polar coordinates have a singularity origin. There's a bit like that, but they're useful because they allow you to talk about field theories in Minkowski space. The boundary of the space time is Minkowski space, not Einstein static universe. So we typically like to do field theory in Minkowski space. It's useful to also consider these coordinate system. Okay. The other coordinates you can put, um, uh, I, I won't go through many others. You'll see lots in the, in the literature. Um, I will leave it as an exercise for you to work out what these coordinates look like in terms of my embedding. And then let me say one more thing about the symmetries, and, and then we can do some calculations with these metrics. So let's talk about the isometries of areas d plus 1. And to do this, I'm, I'm just going to use this embedding coordinates. Right, so this, this is this hypersurface in Rd, 2. Rd, 2, so this equation leaves the quadratic form in Rd, 2 invariant. Right? It leaves the natural flat metric on Rd, 2 invariant. So <coughs> the isometric group is just that group that leaves this equation invariant. So it's an, it's an orthogonal group, it's a special orthogonal group, but it's a special orthogonal group which has in it d-dimensional rotations and two-dimensional rotations but with wrong sign, and boost that mix these two time-like directions with the spatial directions. So it's a bit of a Minkowski-like group but with signature d, comma 2. So, so this is the group you can write down just by inspection and you can work out what the various generators are by by just using the usual realization of the lorentz group like structure on this on this equation but this is the conformal group for a d-dimensional quantum field theory. A quantum field theory, a relativistic quantum field theory has a global Lorentz symmetry, typically, so d, comma, 1. But uh, if I en enlarge that and demand that the theory be invariant under conformal transformations in addition to special relativistic transformations, then that group is really SOD, comma 2. So this is a sort of zeroth order statement that, that you, might, you might use to motivate ADS-CFT, that kinematically, any theory, uh, any conformal field theory, which has to be invariant under a global conformal symmetry, if it had a holographic dual, then that holographic dual better admit an isometry group, which is SOD, comma 2. And there's only one space-time that does this, it's ADS. Okay, so I didn't say this, but ADS D plus 1 is maximally symmetric.
And so it's only it's a unique space time with this isometry. So in, ca in case you're wondering what maximally symmetric means, it, does the, it means the Riemann tensor. is proportional to product of the matrix. So the three kinds of maximally symmetric space times where this proportionality constant is zero plus minus one. When it's zero, it just means Minkowski space because the Riemann tensor being zero, unique solution is Minkowski space. When it's plus one, it's de Sitter, and when it's minus one, it's anti de Sitter. Okay. <coughs> Questions? That's all I'm going to say about the geometry of area space time. Uh, we can, we'll probably pick up some more as we go along, but for now, let, let me leave it at that. There's a reasonably good discussion of the geometry in the review by Malasena et al. from 98. Um, there's also a reasonably good, depending on your taste, review of it in uh, Hawking and Ellis. It's abstract, but it does the job in two pages, what would take uh, much longer to get to. Right? So is, is that clear? Yeah? Well, so uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's not necessarily true. Um, I mean, a same dimensional space time, I, I don't know how you want to count, could have de Sitter, anti de Sitter, or Minkowski asymptotics. Technically, maximally symmetric is defined by this, this Riemann tensor decomposition. Because the Riemann tensor is defined in terms of derivatives of the metric. For the Riemann tensor to be proportional to the metric, something special needs to happen. This is this is that's the statement. I mean, you can check that if this is true, then the Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric. It's an Einstein manifold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but but it's very it's very special for the Riemann tensor to be proportional. Okay. <coughs> Right. Oh, uh, let me just say the following. These, this t, these coordinates, um, roughly speaking, the time coordinate orbits of d by dt run like this, whereas orbits of d by d tau were global time evolution. d by dt just lives inside this wedge, so it sort of propagates you in this arc. This is t equals minus in this whole plane is t equals minus infinity, that whole plane is t equals plus infinity. So this slice looks like a piece of a black hole space time. You know, that's why you get it from a black three brain, extremal three brain. In fact you can see that as z goes to infinity, this is the hypersurface z equals infinity, then this coefficient of d by d of this GTT component of the metric goes to zero. It looks like a horizon. So, so this surface is called the Poincaré horizon. This orange surface is called the Poincaré horizon. Right. So, we have 15 minutes. So let's do one simple exercise, and then we'll understand these boundary conditions. 
to do this, I'm going to do a toy model. Questions? Okay. Yeah. Infinity. Yeah. yeah. So just it's just the hyper. It's just a locus here, where this Minkowski part of the metric shrinks to zero size as an overall zero. <coughs> in, in it's the edge of this. Co it's it's not really like any any other coordinate or any other horizon. It's the edge of the coordinate chart because. You can get out of that coordinate chart and go to global ADS space time, but this coordinate chart only describes that piece. Mm -hmm. It has the maximum number of killing vectors. I just don't want to say it's the maximum number of killing vectors for a given dimension because Minkowski space has, you know, the Minkowski group has fewer generators than the ADS group, but they live in the same dimensions. I don't know how to make that statement invariantly. So, you know, so d comma one would also be a solution to this with zero coefficient, zero proportionality constant. The fewer generators in the Minkowski group than in the conformal group. That, that's why I did not want to commit to making it just the largest. It's true that for a given sign of the cosmological constant, it's a maximal symmetry. Algebra allowed. That that is true. But just saying, you know, given dimension is not good enough. <coughs> so let's get an understanding of the boundary conditions by studying a free scalar. Oh, um, I guess we can do something simpler than this. But why don't I leave that as a homework? Um, you know. Whenever you're given a new space-time, which you don't, which I haven't seen before, you want to understand what it looks like. The simplest thing to do is to go find geodesics in it. Just see what particles will do in this space-time. Okay. So I'll tell you what the particles will do, and then you can work it out yourself. Um, So here's my box, uh, my ADS space time. So <coughs> I'll give you a few trajectories. So first of all, it's a homogeneous space, uh, it's, which is implied by it being maximally symmetric. Um, there's a so there's no preferred origin, but let me talk about this row equals zero locus as the as the center of the space, and there's a unique time like geodesic with, uh, with just where there's a world line of an observer who just sits at row equals 0. There are other geodesics, the other time like geodesics, which oscillate around this, which, the, which execute periodic motion around the origin. And the period is set by the ADS radius, so this, this distance time distance is LA, proportional to LADS. This is the only scale in the problem, so everything has to be proportional to that. If you boost this observer to infinity, what he or she will do is go hit the boundary. So, um, And this infinitely boosted geodesic is a null geodesic. The white ones are time-like. And you can see that there's a null geodesic that starts at the boundary and makes it out to the boundary. And it should be clear to you from my drawing that it starts out at one point on the sphere, goes through the origin of the space, and makes it out to the antipodal point on the sphere, right? If it was, if we, this was a circle, this is on the, on one side of the circle. This is in the antipodal side of the circle. 
So on the sphere, if this is a north pole, this is a south pole. Because th this, this space is spherically symmetric around, around this axis, around the board. <coughs> so null geodesic, make it out. You know, they, they traverse the entire space-time in finite coordinate distance. They, of course, take infinite affine parameter because they have to go to infinity. But there are null geodesics that traverse the space-time in finite tau interval. Because if this is tau equals 0, this is tau equals pi in ADS units. Uh, I, le I leave it to you to work out the pi. It's an exercise. Okay? So that's, that's it for geodesic space like geodesic such a space like geodesic in the hyper. E e yes, yes, yes. The, 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 so, okay, very good, very good, very good. So, so you see, this whole plane I drew here was a null plane. So that, so there is a null, so there is a null geodesic that just stays on the boundary, which is this dark orange line, right? Because the Einstein static universe has a null geodesic, but there's also this line that. which is this geodesic. Okay. That's right. So, so yes. So, so the, in fact, many null geodesics, I just drew one. I, I just drew this one with zero angular momentum, if you will. It's a radially ingoing null geodesic. But you can work out all of them. It's, it's, it's a simple algebra problem. They're all simple ODEs. You can integrate them. Um, they have been worked out ad infinitum in the literature, but you, you can do it in short order. So. <clears throat> so that should, if you, if you do that, I, 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 I think it's really instructive to do that exercise if you haven't done, seen it done before or haven't done it yourself before. It, it, it gives you a good sense for what the space-time looks like, how, how particles will behave in the space-time. Okay, let me quickly tell you a little bit about klein gordon field free scalars. In ADS D plus one, and then we can resume tomorrow. So what I want to solve is I want to solve this klein gordon equation. And, um, okay, so this is box. So you can check that nablas A, nabla A, phi. If you haven't seen this before. So if I work in the Poincaré coordinates, root g is um, z to the d plus 1. And if I write phi function of t, x, and z in Fourier basis, then
Ja? Right. So, we can actually solve this equation. This equation has a solution, but let me not try to solve it. Let me just ask what happens as z goes to 0. I claim that the solution phi of z is of the form, uh, let, me, let me call it this, a, some coefficient, which is a function of omega and k, uh, z to the delta minus. I, I just multiply this metric by L A D S squared. I want Z to be dimensionless. So So that's the asymptotic solution. These are the asymptotic solutions. And you can see that one of them, you know, the delta minus term falls off more slowly than the delta plus term. They're both power loss, but clearly one power loss slower than the other. And the delta minus term is a, is a slower power law. So the, the assertion is the following. The delta minus term, which is the A coefficient, is not normalizable. It's usually called the non-normalizable mode. And B is a normalizable mode. The, these are technical terms. They, they, what they mean is that if you take the Klein-Gordon norm, the inner product defined by the Klein-Gordon equation, then this will converge and this won't converge. And in the field theory, this corresponds to I'll describe this for you tomorrow. This corresponds to frozen data. Frozen boundary conditions. This corresponds to response to these frozen boundary conditions. Okay. So I'll go through this, and th this is the basic this dictionary of ADS-CFT that you should know uh, for doing any calculation in any context which is to distinguish what are the boundary conditions and what are the physical parameters. The responses of physical boundary conditions are given to us. But for me to, be, for, for me to do that properly, I would like you guys to spend five minutes this evening convincing yourself that this is the right solution. Okay? That what I described here for the wave equation and the solutions is correct. And once you do that, then tomorrow we can take from here and try to understand the meaning of these statements and set up the dictionary for other observables in ADS CFT. Okay, so I think uh, it's about exactly about time. So let let me stop here for the day and take questions if there are any. No further questions. Very good. So.